welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of 1968. We're in the midst of our discussion about civil rights in 1968. And in the previous lecture, I talked about some of the racial violence and clashes, the Kerner Commission report, and the Orangeburg massacre that took place in February. In this lecture, I turn to perhaps the most memorable event of the entire year of 1968, the assassination of Martin Luther King, Jr. In November of 1967, Martin Luther King began planning his, what would turn out to be his final program, the Poor People's Campaign. He declared a, quote, war on sleep and began working almost around the clock. By early 1968, it had taken a toll on him. He had gained weight and appeared worn down. He had engaged in numerous marital affairs and had begun to think about breaking the news to his wife, Coretta. He was constantly asked to make appearances for various causes and found it hard to say no. He was hounded by the FBI and frequently received death threats. Increasingly, his speeches took on a tone of resignation. He told his congregation in Atlanta, I'm tired of all this traveling I have to do. I'm killing myself, and I'm killing my health. I'm tired now. His wife, Coretta, later wrote, We had a sense of fate closing in. It seemed as if there were great forces driving him. He worked as if it was to be his final assignment. At the same time, sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, had plenty to complain about. They made less than $100 a week on average, had no benefits, no insurance, and no retirement plans. There were no uniforms or raincoats. In those days, people often didn't put the trash out on the curb. It was left near the back door of their homes. And they rarely used garbage bags as we do now. They just piled the garbage directly into the can. So the workers exhausted themselves, dragging heavy cans out to the trucks, and frequently ended up soaked in disgusting garbage juices by the end of the day. They also worked in garbage trucks that were outdated and exceedingly dangerous. Accidents were common. On February 1st, 1968, two garbage workers got snagged by the crushing mechanism and were crushed to death in one of the trucks. It was the last straw. On February 12th, over a thousand sanitation workers in Memphis walked out on strike. The mayor was intransigent and refused to budge. The garbage started to pile up. A local minister named James Lawson, an old friend of Martin Luther King, spoke to the workers. You are human beings. You deserve dignity. You're not a slave. You are a man. The slogan stuck and I am a man became the phrase most identified with this strike. And these images are some of the most identifiable of the year 1968. On March 17th, Lawson invited Martin Luther King to come to Memphis to encourage the strikers. Despite his exhaustion and his busy schedule, King agreed. He came to believe that the sanitation workers and the poor people's campaign that he had been working on represented the same cause. A successful sanitation strike would sound a positive note as the Poor People's Campaign got underway. On March 28th, King arrived in Memphis to lead a peaceful march with the workers. But things didn't go well. More militant young blacks infiltrated the crowd and began to incite the crowd. As the march progressed, they began to break windows pushed their way through the crowd, throwing bottles and bricks. They began looting and starting fires. King and his entourage broke from the crowd and escaped, but it was a dizzying experience for him. The tactic of nonviolent protest that he had used for over a decade seemed to be losing its impact. He confided to his closest friend, Ralph Abernathy, We live in a sick nation. Maybe we just have to give up and let violence take its course. Maybe people will listen to the voice of violence. They certainly won't listen to us. King got out of town, but he knew he had to go back to Memphis. He had to organize a peaceful march 
to show the world that he was still the respected leader that he had always been, and that nonviolence would prevail in the end. While some urged him to go to Washington to launch his Poor People's Campaign, King said, Memphis is the Washington campaign in miniature. The movement lives or dies in Memphis. On April 3rd, King arrived back in Memphis. It was a stormy night with deadly tornadoes ripping through the area. Nonetheless, King addressed an enthusiastic crowd at the Mason Temple. He recalled an event from ten years earlier when a deranged woman had plunged a letter opener into his chest. The doctor told him that if he had sneezed, he would have punctured his aorta and died. And I'm so glad, he said, that I didn't sneeze. It was here that he gave his famous mountaintop speech, one of the most famous of his career, and of course, part of the reason it stands out is because it seems so premeditated, as if he knew what was coming. He said, We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. After those words, he collapsed into Abernathy's arms. Meantime, another man had also arrived in Memphis. James Earl Ray, operating under the pseudonym Eric Galt, who noticed pictures of King in front of his room at the Lorraine Hotel. Ray rented a room at a flop house across the street with a perfect view of the Lorraine, and he waited. At just after 6 p.m. on April 4th, King left his room and lingered for a while on the balcony. Ray spotted him and moved into action, lining up his sights and firing a single bullet. It hit King on the cheek and swept down to his neck. It was a soft tip, exploding bullet, and the shrapnel tore through King's neck, severing his spinal cord and shattering his jaw. Chaos ensued. King's entourage gathered around him, while media and law enforcement crowded into the parking lot below. Someone started snapping pictures. A policeman yelled, asking where the shot came from, and King's men instinctively pointed. King clung to life for about an hour before being declared dead at the hospital. Jesse Jackson, who was there, said in an interview afterward, The white people don't know it, but the white people's best friend is dead. Martin Luther King had been a buffer between the races. The news went out on the airwaves immediately, and the nation exploded. Law enforcement everywhere braced for the worst, anticipating race riots. In many cities, riots did break out. In Boston, James Brown performed a televised concert and pleaded with viewers to stay home, and the riots were averted. In Indianapolis, Robert Kennedy gave a heartfelt speech to a stunned crowd, and the riots were averted there. But in many cities, frustrated and angry blacks took to the streets. In Washington, D.C., where hundreds of fires were started, it became a military zone as soldiers patrolled the streets and set up gun nests at the Capitol. There were riots and looting in Chicago, Baltimore, Newark, and dozens of other cities. Stokely Carmichael, the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, now became the most visible black leader, and he was angry. When white America killed Dr. King, he said, she declared war on us. The rebellions that have been occurring around this country, that's just life, light stuff compared to what's about to happen. King's death drew notice all over the world. One newspaper commented, King's death once again reminds the world of the sick society America is. It may well be that the era of nonviolence has died with its prophet. 
While the quest to find King's killer became a major news story, his followers were more concerned with the race hatred that had inspired that murder. One said, We are not so concerned with who killed Martin as with what killed him. All of American society seemed implicated. Coretta her herself said, There were many fingers on that rifle. A few days later, the nation was transfixed in watching Martin Luther King's funeral. Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, the president of Morehouse College and King's spiritual and educational mentor, delivered the eulogy at the funeral. In part, he said, Make no mistake, the American people are in part responsible. The assassin heard enough condemnation of King and of Negroes to feel that he had public support. He knows that millions hated King. The Memphis sanitation strike, incidentally, ended on April 15th with success for the strikers. The mayor of Memphis conceded that after King's death, they had to get the strike resolved. And so the strikers achieved some minor gains, union recognition, and a modest pay raise. As one of the strikers commented, we won, but we lost a good man along the way. In our next lecture, we'll talk a little bit more about what happens with the civil rights movement in the aftermath of King's death.